What's up, strength coaches? Welcome back to another episode of Research Tuesday, where we are bringing you actual, real reasons as to why you need to do real research, because we are trying to kill bro science and boo, 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 social boo, boo, media boo, boo, boo. science. It's got to go away. All right, so we're here. Episode two, we are going to do a live search for you. Episode one, we talked about why you need to actually be conducting research. Episode two, we're going to show you how you actually do it. So, G Money. Let's get it rolling. All right. How many times have you heard, oh, I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, I don't need research. I don't need to back up any of the claims that I make. Well, guess what? That is a joke because if we're being asked to, as academics, to provide evidence about why we do what we do, and when I had a mentor, she was a PhD, and she used to ask me, why are you training people the way that you train? And at first I took offense to that because I was like, how dare you question my awesomeness? But then I realized I had to back it up with science. And we all have to do it. So any coach that says, well, I don't have to do it. I've been doing this for 20 years. Run. Away. Amen to that. So do you want to start with Google Scholar? Because that's what we talked about last week was. Yeah. Let me pop up and let's just jump into this. So we talked last week why we need to do research. What are the components? How to read a research paper? You know, certain areas. The best way to do this is to do it while learning. Or do it, do it together. Um, let me share my screen. And let's just go to this amazing new tab. Welcome. This is my amazing new tab. Now, the coolest thing here is the simplest thing that's out there is Scholar. Google Scholar. And Justin, you and I were talking about considering, you know, the, the new stuff that's going on. The Achilles. So, what should we look up? Uh, I would type in Achilles rupture. Achilles tendon, tendon rupture. Perfect. It's fantastic. So, right here, the very first thing that you get presented with, and I love this stuff, it's you have Google Scholar, a ton of articles that are here. We don't even know if these are ones that we want to actually look at. So, it, let's just say in the last 10 years, Let's pick 10 years, 20, 23, and 2013. Now, there may be other good data, but let's just take the most recent of 10 years. Uh, it did that for me. Let's see, we've got 2018, management of an acute tendon rupture. That's a review. Those are different than... Mm -hmm. That's actual. important to note for everybody right there, a review versus like an actual research study, but again... Yes. Useful in a handful of research that you have. Systematic reviews uh, are really good because it takes a bunch of other studies and pulls in that data and analyzes that data. Uh, scoping reviews, those are a different thing. Those look at a research question. We'll talk about that in another episode, developing a question. But what they do with the scoping review is they develop a research question, then they go and they look at what research exists and identifies a gap. So here we have something from 2013. Notice I'm looking at the dates. Do these matter? Now, why does the date matter, Greg? If anybody's listening, they're like, well, what, why did he bring that up? So within 10 years, a lot of stuff has changed in the past five years. Technology has changed in the last five years. Technology has changed in the last 10 years. Sometimes uh, research comes out and while it may be the most recent, it hasn't actually made it to, say, the American Medical Association in terms of an approved treatment or modality. This is just research that's being done before it gets uh, standardized into practical applications that providers may use. When it comes to things like uh, physical therapy, chiropractor, athletic training, uh, even you know heart surgery, all of these things have to go through a board review to get approved, and people and it even people who sit on that board have to be approved. So there's a lot of you know within the last ten years, it's kind of a good thing to look at. If we wanted to go back twenty years, we may see some things that exist now in treatments. Uh, whereas ten years, this may be the forefront of cutting edge research, but. I'm going to drop down here. This looks neat. Acute, an update on treatment. This is from 2017. Um, and it was a population-based study from 2014. 
out of all of these, it's cited by 93, which means, oh, here's one that's cited by 103. Anytime you have citations, like low citations, maybe it's too new, or maybe it wasn't relevant for other people's studies, but 93 is a good number uh, because that means, you know, out of the ones here, it means it's heavily cited. These others are as well, but let's just jump into this one. Acute Achilles tendon ruptures on treatment. We'll wait for that to load. Um, and here we are. We see that, oh, we're behind a paywall. Mm. Um, so there's yeah. something to be aware of whenever you're doing your searches is sometimes it's either a paywall or you have to request access to download it. Correct. All right. And so let's just read the abstract real quick and see if this is even relevant. Acute rupture of the Achilles tendon is common and seen most frequently in people who are participate in recreational athletics into the 30s and 40s. Hmm. Although goals of treatment have not changed in the past 15 years, that's what we were just talking about. Recent studies of non-surgical management, specifically functional bracing with early range of motion, demonstrate re-rupture rates similar to those of tendon repair and result in fewer wound and soft tissue complications. So this is an article talking about the fact that you can treat an Achilles tendon rupture without doing surgery and it would have the same essential outcome because your likelihood of re-rupture was just as likely? Correct. Huh. And another thing to note, here are the authors, Anish Kadakia, Robert Decker, and Bryant Ho. Notice the source. This is always something to be aware of. This is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. So these are the people that are doing the surgery. This is the Academy, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. These are the people, it's probably, they're all obviously board certified. They probably all have an MD of some sort because they're a surgeon. Um, and then this is the publisher, right? That is great because if it came from, you know, Joe's Crab Shack Journal of Awesome Town, <laughs> you know, then you might say, you know what, is this really valid? Should I trust this? How do you know if this is trustworthy? So we've done this search because we're behind a paywall. Unfortunately, we're going to back what up. What if you copy the copy the DOI? <clears throat> yeah, we can do that. And then try going into ResearchGate with it. Because sometimes, like here's a little hack for anybody. If you get behind a paywall, sometimes ResearchGate will have it for you. Not always, but sometimes. Yes, that is true. And this true. is why we're doing this live for everybody, so that way you know that this is... Do you uh, see this loading? I do not. I still see the acute Achilles tendon, A-A-T-R. All right, let me stop that share. I'm just going to share my screen so that way we can just bounce around. Sounds good. Uh, uh, screen two. And this is what... This is an old thing that I was looking up. Isokinetic stroke, gotcha. Please stop going to that. Clearly, I don't know how to use the internet today. Quick break from the show to remind you to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out and it helps you be notified when we have new content get released. So again, please hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoy this content. And with that, let's get back to the show. Well, let's just accept all these cookies. This is the same thing that we were just looking at. Yeah. Yeah, they all do have an MD. Um, let's just go here. There we go. Can you see that? Yep. Oh, you Join don't for have, free. You don't even have a research game. I do, and we're oh, not okay. going there either. Oh, that looks neat. Where'd you go, DOI? This is the fun part. Oh, down over there to the right-hand side. Journal of over there. Yep, above that little... Yeah, there, you go. there you are. See? Let's copy that. Boink! Um, that clearly was garbage. So now you can see some of the stuff that we deal with. Here... You might be able to copy the name of the uh, article. I'm just going to do something even cooler. Let me just log into the George Mason library. Oh, gotcha. 
Doink. So here's another little hack for you. If you do have, you know, if you're in school or graduate school, we'll utilize that uh, library as well because, as he's going to show you, you most likely might have access to it because of the university that you are enrolled in. Or if you recently graduated, I graduated uh, less than a year ago, so I have access, I still have continued alumni access to this. The other thing is any university librarian will love to help you do research. They love doing research. Librarians aren't just to put books back and chase kids around. Librarians love to do research, at least the ones I've met love to do research. And it looks like I just saw a download PDF. So there yep. you guys go. So by, There's your little hack right there, folks. Yeah. Go see a librarian, even at a public library. Uh, this looks cool. What happened? It's downloaded. Oh, there it is. Yay. Now, look at that, folks. Problem solving for you right there. Yeah, public libraries love to help you with this, too. I mean, here's the thing. What we're trying to get at and explain is that if you want to be better at your craft and you have questions of like why are people doing what they're doing it takes work none of us you know did this and we're like yeah okay cool i only did put five minutes in you get in what you put out or you whatever you know what i mean you get out of you it get what out you, what put, you in. put in yeah. and to, to caveat what he's saying in terms of like if you want to go like maybe you just batch it out on a day and you're like hey I'm going to go do some research and I'm going to go to the public library so I have access to all these articles and then you go and you read them and you go and you like I said you just batch it out because back to what we said in the first episode it's you know come up with a question figure out what you need to do learn ask a question learn ask a question because what we'll wind up doing is we'll look at this and be like hey what are some different, what are the different resources, or excuse me, the other references from this article? And then be able to be like, hey, this is interesting, this is interesting. And what we'll do is we'll down, like, we'll, we'll provide this DOI link in the YouTube, and then that way you guys can all Google it, look it up yourselves, and then, yeah. Yeah. So, here we are. They're all doctors. Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Feinberg School of Medicine, out of Chicago, Northwestern University. Fantastic article. I mean, this is interesting, the fact that they're going to be act like that many medical doctors are going to say not to do uh, surgery on the Achilles tendon. That's very interesting to me. Yeah. Because we here's the abstract, acute ruptures. Further investigated investigation is necessary to warrant routine use of biological adjuncts and the management of acute Achilles tendon ruptures. Now we're just going to start going through and like just picking out words. It looks like this was done 30 to 49 years of age, recreational athletes from 2014. Uh, for incidents, increasing incidents of acute rupture in the 49 to 60 year age group. So the so, older you get. Yeah, the older you get. And this isn't really to talk about this, about tendon ruptures. This is more for us to find something that is to go through this process to find research about the subject. Because this is just one paper. I mean, if you think about, or one study that we're looking at, if you think about how many are behind articles that we write, I mean, I easily have 20 to 30 per thing that I write up. And you have to read all of those. If you're not yeah, reading... Typically, there's a minimum, and you also will have a maximum for certain articles. But yes, you're right. Right. Rehabilitation protocols, non-surgical management. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff here. Wean out of the boots. These are weeks. Uh, I'm definitely going to tell you that I'm in this. I'm oh, in yeah, the, you messed your foot up. Yep, I am in the two to four week range right now. Um, and I am, I am following this and being as compliant as possible. Neat. Look at that. 12 weeks, 8 to 12 weeks. Wean out of a boot. Ugh. Not fun. So that's just one search that we did. Let's go back and see where we are. That was Google Scholar. That's one search. Now, one of the things to remember is look at the search term that we did, Achilles tendon rupture. That's what we looked for. We set it for 10 years. We got back, did it tell us how many results? 18,000 thousand results how can we make this a little bit more specific right 
Mm-hmm. So Achilles tendon rupture. These are all rehabilitation. This means it's happened. Okay. Let's talk about Achilles tendon rupture. Look, there's a word prevention. So we'll keep that in our book. Now we've got 1600 results. That's horrible. Um, how can we, we only dropped 2000 there. Maybe we should, what? Yeah, let's make it the last five years. Let's make it the last five years, 2018. Which I think is six years, but whatever. Now we've dropped down to 10,000. So now you we've got... got tw- uh, you got 2018 to 2013. Or no, that's... Yeah. You're updated. You're right. Um, I-, I couldn't read it. Let's let's make it 2019 to 2013. Now we're to 8,560. So that's in the last five years. Jeez. All right. And then look. This one's great. Risk factors for Achilles tendon rupture, an updated systematic review. That means it's been, this is a systematic review, which is probably going to be massive. And now there's an update to this and that's from 22, right? So let's take a look real quick. Let's see what they got. Do we get to see this whole one? Full article. Full article. Again, you've got the DOI. You've got their ID, which means that they're on ORC ID. Uh, we should all have those. I have mine. It makes it easy to track articles. But let's take a look. This was a systematic review carried out using PubMed, ESCO, Science Direct databases. This means that they've used all of these different databases. So when we're talking about ResearchGate and Google Scholar, PubMed's one, EBSCO, and ScienceDirect databases, those are all others as well. Um, All types of research studies were eligible. So that means random controlled trials, which means uh, participants are randomly assigned to a treatment modality, whether it's a control, Uh, Treatment 1, Treatment 2, or a combination. Uh, Cohort studies, which is just groups of people coming in. Case control studies, cross-sectional studies. Uh, All of these are eligible, right? Inclusion criteria, this is something to look at. We're written in English, so people had to read and understand English. Uh, Populations are both men and women, both athletes and non-athletes. So this is covering a lot of people, healthy individuals, Healthy individuals is kind of a general term because maybe we'll figure that out a little bit more. Um, Patients, I guess that's people who are undergoing some kind of procedure. And then two independent reviewers were used, used the assessment instrument, Newcastle Ottawa scale independently. What is that? So let's go look that up. If you find something that you don't know what it means, there's a simple thing called Google search. And let's just see how to use National Institutes of Health Quality Assessment Form for Cohorts. Okay, this is some kind of instrument, quality instrument. It's scored by awarding a point for each answer that is marked with an asterisk below. That's kind of neat. But there's a lot of things that standardize how studies are done, especially when it comes to systematic reviews, scoping reviews, meta-analysis. Those all have policies and procedures that people have to follow in order to ensure that the uh, research is sound, accurate, and reproducible. That's one of the biggest things. And again, I'm going to go back to this because this is something that really frustrates me. Holy crap, don't look at that. What frustrates me here is when someone's like, oh, I don't, I don't believe in research. So when someone says they don't believe in research or they don't do research, that's anecdotal evidence at best and just an opinion. And it could be backed by you know years of studies that or years of them applying and working with people. But the, the whole purpose of having methods in a document here Right, these protocols. Let's see if we can get down to. Oh boy, if you don't like seeing blood, don't look, because apparently. Yeah, those of you that are listening to the audio and you didn't, you're not looking at the YouTube. I mean, it's 
pretty scarred up um, tendon that's, right there. That's operative. That's people inside it. Yeah, sorry, that's what I poor use of my words. It's, it's all good. The sliced. It's the sliced version. The back of your foot. Yeah. So they don't really have a whole methods protocol here. This is just an update. This is like an article, yeah, a review article versus a research article. Correct. There's a difference, folks, right there. Yep, there's a massive difference there. So we, we saw this. We used that one. Maybe we'll go back to... Let's, let's find a research article. Something that isn't a systematic review. Because then we can go surgery or conservative management for Achilles tendon rupture... Oh, uh, yeah. This is another systematic review and meta-analysis. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, recent research efforts, optimal methods, Achilles rupture mechanisms. This guy's name is Tarantino, so that's cool. So, yeah, right? So let's just go check. This this may be Here we go. principles right. of rehabilitation. I'm just scrolling real quick. Return to play protocols. Just seeing what they have in conclusions. So, and then the references. Look, look at all these. Jeez Louise. See now, there's a balance. There's a fine line between that too, because it's like, at what point do you need to always have a research article backing your statement? After, like, what becomes common common knowledge within the field of what we do? You know what I mean? Like, what's that duality? What's that dichotomy? Right. I don't know. I mean, clearly, there's a lot of history here. Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you guys about our sponsor, Team Builder. If you have any online training platform needs, Team Builder is the go-to place. Team Builder has the ability to integrate with velocity-based training tools. They have the ability to program and have notes and videos for all of your athletes and your clients. This is your number one stop shop. Been using it since 2019 when I was working at Towson. So I've used it, love it. Make sure you check it out. Go ahead, click the link down in the description. And with that, let's get back to the show. And 109 articles they felt needed to prove their point. I sometimes find that if you have mm, 30, you should be good. Um, it, but here, I guess they're really trying to hone in, hone in on it. Where are they from? And this is from the junk, the Journal of Functional Morphology and Kinesiology, which I think I published in. But. The whole thing's here. We didn't have to log into anything. So it's the thickest, strongest tendon. It's neat. 12 to 15 centimeter long, both the gastroc and the soleus. Thickest. Do they talk about the test to, uh, to show like what a practitioner, whether a, uh, athletic trainer or doctor would do to test to see if there actually is a need for an MRI? I forget the name of it, but like what the, the test that they do uh, you know, like it's called like a locksman for the ACL. Like, what is mm. do they do they name it in that research article? What the test is? Well, test to check Achilles tendon. The Thompson test. Thompson test. That's what it Look is. It's at like that. you just. I mean, you just literally. squeeze the. And, and honestly, it's like you just squeeze it, and if you see, um, you're supposed to just squeeze down there, and if the toe doesn't um, plantar flex, that's when you're like, oh shit. All right, well, let's read about that, right? The cat, like, this is, this is it. This is research. I mean, like, I don't know anything about this, so I'm getting educated as we go through here. It even tells you how to do these things, how to do these tests. What is this, Physiopedia? I'm not sure if this is a legitimate site, but it seems one way to assess that is, look, they actually have references. Okay, and why does that matter? Oh, this is from 1962, uh, and it's the Thompson. It's the reason it's the Thompson test is because this guy, I guess, came up with it in the Journal of Trauma in 1962. So since we see this here, I'm going to do this. This is called reverse searching. We're looking at the reference. We found this. It explains what the technique is. Let's go back to... That's the history of lacrosse, which is very important. Um, let's go here and go back to Google Scholar. Or what was the other one? Pick one. Uh, ResearchGate. 
I don't know why ResearchGate is called a social networking service. Is it really? That's what it says. But here. I mean, I used it a ton diving down rabbit holes for the PhD. This is the guy, the Thompson test. And of course, what is the first thing that shows up? Something that's not of that era. MRI is unnecessary for diagnosing. So now we're getting just basic reverse searching, looking for this article. We're now seeing different ways to assess Achilles tendon ruptures. And this is where I'm going to be honest. You can literally have input overload where you're like, oh my God, there's so much stuff. Because there is. You know, let's, let's look at this MRI is unnecessary. Why? Who's this from? David Garas and Stephen Riken, the Rothman Orthopedic Institute. Source from PubMed. PDF is available. Look at that. Let's go download full text PDF. Or let's just read it. I don't feel like downloading it. Look. There it is. So abstract. Achilles tendon ruptures are common in middle-aged athletes. Notice the trend here. It seems to all be middle-aged athletes. Although MRI is commonly used to document ruptures, there is no literature supporting its routine use, and we wondered whether it was necessary. This is a massive question. Is it necessary? MRIs, we get charged for those, right? Our health insurance. But anyway, now we're looking at the abstract. We have a background. We have their questions. Their first question is, we determined the sensitivity of physical examination and diagnosing acute Achilles ruptures to compare the sensitivity of physical examination with that of MRI. So they're comparing physical examination alone, comparing physical examination with MRI, and assessed care delays and impacts attributable to MRI. I'm going to assume maybe, correctly or incorrectly, that what they are doing there is saying that there were delays, care delays or something. We'll have to read more about it. But here we go. We now have methods. They retrospectively compared 66 patients with surgically confirmed acute Achilles ruptures and preoperative MRI with control group of 66 patients without preoperative MRI. So let's think about what that just said. We can reproduce that if we wanted, where we could go get some patients that have surgically confirmed acute ruptures. That means that the, uh, they had a preoperative MRI. That means that somewhere they had an MRI. It showed that it was ruptured. Then during surgery, they confirmed again that it was ruptured. And if you think that anyone is just like, I've been a surgeon for 22 years. I don't have to prove my work. That's BS. It's 100% BS because they have to follow checks and balances because it's under our insurance, all of that stuff is heavily monitored. So 66 patients with confirmation plus an MRI, and then 66 patients, it doesn't say whether they were confirmed surgically, so that would be a question that we might call in the validity or the strength of this article. Is it strong or weak? So they didn't have a pre-op MRI, so I guess they just confirmed it during surgery. Uh, criteria were abnormal Thompson test. Okay, so now we're knowing that diagnostic criteria were abnormal Thompson test, decreased resting tension, and palpable defect. Uh, then they're also looking at time to diagnose and surgical procedures compared with the control group. So they're giving us kind of a roadmap to understand what their thought process was, what steps they took to get here. The results, uh, they've summarized this because it's in the abstract, but all patients had three clinical findings preoperatively and complete ruptures intraoperatively. MR images were read as complete in 60, partial in four, inconclusive in two. It took five days, a mean of five days to obtain MRI after the injury, eight days for the initial evaluation, and 12 days for surgical intervention. So, sounds like if you rupture a tendon, you want to get an MRI, according to this, probably maybe more than faster than five days, maybe eight days faster to get evaluated, and maybe jump into surgery sooner if you can. But knowing my experience from what I'm going through with my foot, um, 
I'm on a four week window. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's not, I don't know. All right. Well, that's an, just an example of what we've been doing. I'm going to stop sharing because that looks amazing. But yeah. that process there is something that people should understand that it's like, it's not just, yo, I did, I just did one thing. You need to look at, you have to put into Google Scholar or any research database what it is that, what your question is. If you don't have a question, uh, you know, you could start to think constructively, like, what is it that you're interested in? You know, or maybe you saw something on TikTok, Instagram that were like, hey, look at these fast feet. You know, does that help? I don't, I don't know. Uh, you can always go and look and be like, is there tempo, you know, training to improve uh tendon rupture incidents or something you know i mean like it's coming up with that question but once you plug it in you're gonna find that there's a ton of research but then how do you kind of weed through all that research you then have to jump into what time period are you looking are there advancements in the past five years ten years notice we had like ten thousand to eighteen thousand results that's a lot to weed through. Are you going to go through that? No, we want, to, we want to pull that down and get more specific with what those questions are. But then maybe you find an article that sounds really good and then they make a claim in there and you go and look up that reference and it's like, well, let's go read that paper. So Google, Google Scholar even says it really well that you know, standing on the shoulders of giants of those who came before us, there's a ton of people that have done this research that are out there and if you think that your thing is new or your idea or your concept is new it may be but it's building upon research that others did unless it's absolutely completely novel and there is no research around it whatsoever uh in which case you're kind of forging a new path out there having a great time but hopefully yeah. And most likely people aren't going to either fund your research or, or if you're doing a dissertation or a capsule and people are going to be like, ah, you got to start, you got to stay in your lane before you go too crazy. Yes. But what we're covering here, and hopefully this is helping, it's that we're trying to make it such that as a strength coach, you know, you are more informed. You are out there asking questions. You are building your tool set, you know, in your brain. And you're walking around going, man, why do they do that? What are they doing? Is that, is that legit? You know, and that's something that, you know, even both Justin and I have helped each other. Again, Justin was my advisor for my master's thesis and asked some questions. And it's, you got to be open to these questions being asked because you're going to have to defend your stance, you're going to have to defend your claims, you're going to have to back those things up with evidence, and it can't just be, hey, I did a thing. And it can be, and those are called observational studies. And we'll talk about the difference between the different types of studies, but those observational studies are the lowest, the weakest studies that you could ever do, because there is no methodology, there is no uh, system. There are no research questions. You're literally just writing down stuff that you see. And I would like to say, I think a lot of people do that when they have technology, right? Because they're like, yo, I got all this data, but it's what you do with that data that determines its usefulness. Otherwise you're just, you know, playing bingo at that point. Amen to that. Um, <clears throat> The one that I want to talk about next week, so for everybody previewing next week, is we're going to talk about whether it be the Achilles tendon or hamstring stuff because um, Pell over at G, uh, Catapult sent me an article that they just did on uh, the difference between hamstring loading on grass and artificial turf. So I'll send that to you, and we will discuss that for next week. That sound good? Sweet, sweet. Bingo! Bingo! <laughs> <clears throat> All right, everybody, you have a good rest of your research Tuesday, and we will be talking with you later. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.